All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to focus on why you can't lose belly fat in a way you've never heard before. I'm pretty sure you've never heard before. And we're gonna go deep in three different areas. And I'll give you the answer first, so there's no question about it. The reason you can't lose belly fat or people have a difficult time with losing that last piece of belly fat, I hear that all the time. Yeah, they've done keto and they've lost a lot of weight. Good for them, they lost fat, but they can't lose their belly fat. Hmm, why is that? Three reasons. One is you have a genomic or genetic predisposition. We're gonna go into that without being too esoteric. You will get this, you will understand it, and you know how to find out about it. Second is obviously diet. We're gonna look into dietary omissions that have been created over the last 70, not quite 100 years, but we'll say last 70 years, which is more the norm in the United States where I'm speaking from. So that's big contribution. And the third is various medications that further obstruct the ability to absorb this one thing. So this one thing is going to be choline. And before we get into all those details, do not think, I just got the answer and I'll take choline and I, I will lose fat. It doesn't work that way. And in fact, if you take choline and you don't need choline, you will put yourself in a more problematic situation. All right, let's get to it. So the question is, why won't your belly fat go away after you've been through keto, after you've been through all your special diets? How is that? We're not talking about fat in general. We're talking specifically about belly fat. It's a big issue. And I think it has a lot to do with choline. And I'm going to tell you all about it. There's really three reasons why this is directly relative to choline. One is you're probably lack of choline, appropriate amount of choline in your diet. So you're deficient. The other is that you have perhaps have genetic predispositions that block your ability to use choline dietarily and or make choline for yourself, which we can do as humans. And the third is perhaps you're even taking medications unbeknownst to you that is blocking your ability to absorb, incorporate choline. So choline is incredibly important. It's a methyl donor, of course, we talk about methylation, but Top, top of the bat is right down here. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the brain directly has to do with memory and learning. Memory and learning. So young people need it, older people need it to remember each other, to remember you. What were we talking about? And others, cellular communication, platelet activating factors, phosphatidylcholine, we'll get into some of this, but it is dramatically important in so many different areas. And yet, it's easy to be deficient of it. Choline just became a nutrient in the late 90s. So barely 20 plus years ago. And now they're thinking about fortifying it in various foods because they re recognize it's a national disaster that we're also choline deficient. And you have to ask yourself, how did this choline deficiency happen? Was it always the case? If you go back, as I always say, 100 to 150 years ago, were we choline deficient? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, inadequate intake. 90% of Americans are choline deficient. This is from the NIH, by the way. It was easy to add a lot of slides and decided not to and just leave it at this. And what does that lead to? Fatty liver. Yep. Humans eating low choline diets develop fatty liver and liver damage. This dietary requirement for choline is modulated by estrogen. There's a whole story there, which we're not going to go into tonight, but it would be an orientation to women in choline as well. And by single nucleotide polymorphisms, catch the polymorphisms, meaning common mutations, SNPs otherwise, in specific genes of choline and folate metabolisms. How that happens, the concept, how that happens is the concept of overnutrition. What is the concept of overnutrition? You know, we're living in the, the land of milk and honey, are we? We have all such great nutrition. Not at all. Our nutrition has really gone down the tubes and we have a problem. But anyway, overnutrition, the concept came from uh, Dr. Pennington, it's MD. He worked for DuPont in Delaware, and he was invited into DuPont because he was kind of a nutritionally oriented doctor. Huh, don't find many of them anymore. And the reason was, is they found that their staff and their employees were getting pretty chunky, getting overweight. Their obesity rate at the um, DuPont was getting outrageously high. So they hired him and he came up with his diet, which was a version of the ketogenic diet to an extent. And this was an era in which the ketogenic diet was forgotten. It was gone. It wasn't around anymore. Um, so think of, nobody's thinking of the ketogenic diet at all. But 
this paper that came out in 1953 in JAMA was read by no one, none other than uh, Dr. Atkins, who then 10 to 15 years later incorporated this specific diet into the Atkins diet. So this is the first version of the Atkins diet. Um, basically, there wasn't much modification after that. So that's the connection of overnutrition. It was the beginning of the end of real food because we're coming away from World War II. The military industrial complex was just amping up. It also developed a food industrial complex. We were getting into processed foods. Everybody could have something. All right, I want you to think of this as high tide and low tide. Just think of the tide analogy, whether you're thinking of a cove or Let's do this. So in high tide, I probably should have had a better picture, but I want the water up there. So you basically don't see anything. What you see at high tide is very different at low tide. And at low tide, suddenly you're seeing all these sandbars and so on. Let's make it a little more specific. I've lived on the Cape for a while, and uh, it is remarkable. At low tide, the Cape just all goes out, and you can walk for miles. It almost seems like you can walk from Orleans to Hyannis or up to Turo. And so it's just a full bay of water. Nothing special about it other than it's Cape Cod, and it's pretty interesting. Um, but at low tide, it's just the opposite. You could walk for miles. As pretty as this is, what this represents with this analogy that I'm using is that we are now seeing nutrient deficiencies that we have never seen before. Every one of those little sandbars that feel great to walk over as far as you possibly can imagine are just nutritional deficiencies. So the overnutrition is an abundance of calorie-rich food devoid of nutrition. The Dorito syndrome is what I call that. And again, it's the food industrial complex that has managed to make food devoid of nutrition, rich in calories, and this is what we get. So what is overnutrition looks like? It's a complete lack of sustainable nutrition. What we see is nutritional deficiencies that we've never ever seen before in a population level. And so this is an enzyme we're going to be talking about. So it's called phosphatidylalanine methyltransferase. It's a mouthful. Who cares, right? But this is what you need to know is that you can make your own choline. 30%. So it's like a backup battery. If you were really deprived of choline, like most of us are nowadays, and you weren't eating it, well, at least you could make some. But there are people, there's a whole population of people that actually can't make it very well. Ordinarily, that wouldn't have been a problem. If, you're all, if we're all eating nutritious food, who cares? You know that that difference is easily made up by the amount of choline you have by organ meats and uh, egg yolks and so on. And this is the pathway of eating it. So you're 70% dependent on what you eat, consume, exogenous, if you will, in your diet, choline, and 30% you, you can make if you have functioning genes. Many people don't. Okay, so the integration of data is a key to understanding your health. Metabolic, nutrient, hormonal, and genomic. We're going to take you through that a little bit. So lab integration, in my view, is key. And it's um, I'm not unique in that. It's called precision nutrition. It was actually coined by um, NIH, so who cares? But that's what it's called, is using these SNPs, these polymorphisms, in one's assessment of health. So they have an idea. The nice thing about assessing one's genes, it doesn't change. You just have to do that once. It's not like you have to keep on coming back for more blood work. It is pretty permanent. You just pull it out and go, huh. And I've done that for a number of clients that we worked with a year or two ago. I go back, I'm on the hard drive and I go, wow, you know, you're right. There are genes here that I either didn't address at the time or it wasn't an issue given what we were talking about at the time. So looking at your mutations, the SNPs and the polymorphisms, what does that look like? You know, I saw this uh, on another uh, video and I appreciated it, but I felt it fell short. Um, this was on how to lose belly fat specifically, which made me think of this topic. It, it put this at the cause of everything is toxicity, deficiency, stress, or degeneration. Something's falling apart. Okay, I'll buy that. I mean, it's pretty complete. You can put a lot in there. But what it doesn't cover is there's no mention of individual genomic differences. So it's devoid of all that. It's, it's all on the idea of if we all do one thing, we can get the same results. That's not the case. Okay, here's what it looks like. So when you get your SNPs done, when you get your uh, genomic profile done, there's usually about 140 genes we'll look at, and then you pull away the ones that are relevant, and you pull away the ones that you obviously have a problem with or don't have a problem. Okay, so this is just one little panel on S-adenylmethionine, which is a big deal. Think of Sam, Sammy. A lot of people take it as a supplement. 
But this guy, he's a 56 year old male, I forgot to mention that. These are a number of folate. He's heterozygous on all of these, doesn't have that one. So he has a problem with folate and B12, generally speaking. All these are very slow. So I just say, doesn't have that one. Now we go on to ones that are specifically, you saw a pet, specifically about using choline. He is double blocked, homozygous for both genes. He has a problem. And anything that's relative to or incorporated with uh, choline is going to be a problem. So that's uh, real outstanding. So these are the group of genes they're talking about, but he has the worst of the worst in this particular situation. This is another one about folate, just another panel, other SNPs, other polymorphisms. And look at all the ones he has. He has homozygous over here, that's a big player. We have heterozygous right down here. And so what we're looking at at this point, we're not going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We're saying collectively, we can expect the person's story is going to relate to this. It's just too much, too packed full. Not everybody has this kind of intensity of polymorphisms relative to choline and folate and B12, methylation cycle, if you will. Okay, here's another way of looking at it. I don't want to blind you, but I want to point out homocysteine. You know, there's the PET gene here. So the PET gene is really important, taking the PE, phosphatidylethylamine, and changing in its phosphatidylcholine, lecithin. Lecithin's in every cell of the body, and in every plant cell, by the way, too. And so it's very important. If you can't make that, or you make it very poorly, there is going to be a systemic problem. So one of those problems are, to keep it simple, is you're going to have elevated homocysteine. So along with folate and B12 deficiency, inadequate consumption of choline can lead to high homocysteine and all the risks associated with high hyperhomocysteinemia, high homocysteine in the blood. Cardiovascular disease, neuropsychiatric illnesses, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression's a big one, and osteoporosis. Uh, osteoporosis. Inadequate choline intake can also lead to fatty liver and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease pretty well known. This even affects, by the way, your ability to produce glutathione adequately. I mean, you can go on and on. You can see homocysteine eventually gets made into glutathione if you have all the working parts. Again, leads to a problem here. Homocysteine, elevated homocysteine, which is necessary for other things. Here's the gene over here. It's a problem over here. That's all I want you to know. Phosphatidylcholine, it just can't be. One other thing that I wanted to mention, you know, in, in bile, bile is nine parts phosphatidylcholine and one part uh, cholesterol. So when people have a problem with this particular gene, their bile ends up being very heavy with cholesterol. They are much more prone with gallstones. Gallstone, gallbladder is basically where you keep your bile, of course, right? So that's a problem. And it's even more pronounced with women, and that's for that other video down the road. Here's more of saying the same thing. Here's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the problem with this particular faulty gene and elevated homocysteine. There is MTHFR, folate, it's where your diet up here, methionine is what you eat, that's animal products. And there's SAMI, of course. Nutrients, so how's that gonna play? Let's see what that is. So we do an intracellular analysis through SpectraCell. Not perfect, but it's helpful. And what we're doing is we're looking for a match. We're saying, all right, we got the genes. And people can have all the problem genes in the world, but if they have a really good nutrition diet, it probably won't even show up. It would be a, a non-event, a non-issue. But here, when we do collectively have nutrition as a questionable adequacy, let's look at it. So intracellular, we see folate deficient, choline deficient, B12, B12, that's not good. So these three major intracellular deficiencies that directly relate to this person's specific polymorphisms. Again, choline is so important. We can now assume that this person is going to have a problem with all these other related events that come from uh, processes that come from using choline. Neurotransmitters would be the big one and certainly the belly fat. So it's the disappearance of liver and egg yolk from the American diet that makes most uh, takes most of the blame. The loss of cholesterol-rich food like egg yolks and organ meats as a result of cholesterol paranoia, it seems to be at the bottom of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Can it be so simple? Seriously, can it be so simple just to have liver and egg yolks and set yourself free? Okay, metabolic, what are we looking for? This is just a portion of the panel that I do 
to simply show, yes, this person does have elevated homocysteine. Nobody ever told him that before. He has low vitamin D, which is related, but it's not causative. Um, his ratio of omega-6 to 3 is hellacious. It's 11 to it's 11 to 1, meaning he has 11 times more omega-6. 100 years ago, it was 1 to 1. He's got some work to do. So you start putting these together, you go, these are things we could fix to change this person's life. See, you can do this job too. Okay, hormonal. Hormonal. I just want to flash to that because it is important. What we see with this person is that right down here, this is salivary. So these little beads here, they, he, he spits into a little salivary uh, saliva jar, so to say. Um, say one, two, three, four, five times throughout the day and night. And also urinates on a strip. So we measure what is expelled from the body, both by saliva and in urine. And what we find is this guy does not even produce enough cortisol to get into the range. That's a range, the normal, the gray area is the normal range. Cortisol, which is the backup, the inactive form of cortis, uh, cortisone is the inactive form of cortisol. He's low. So if this was also found in blood, it would be called Addison's disease. So truly to be low in cortisol is Addison's disease. Think of John F. Kennedy, the president. Uh, he grew up with post-World War II of just Addison's. And so he was carried in stretchers when he was a representative and so on. And it wasn't until the 50s that they discovered how they could extract cortisol from pigs. Could they give it to humans? And so that's where he'd get his cortisol shots. So he had Addison's, actual Addison. This person has not Addison's, but has uh, adrenal fatigue is what you would call it. So that's a big deal. So he was saying, yeah, I'm just kind of, he's 56. I'm just not feeling great. And I don't, this isn't how I grew up kind of thing. Okay, again, another reference to how low his cortisol is. Uh, Testosterone is fairly low. Uh, DHEA, which is a growth hormone, is low. Um, and there again, we're looking at cortisol, both from the urine total and the sal sal salivary samples. So we put all these together now. We come with kind of a bio-integrated assessment. That's the big picture. Boom, they fit together like a puzzle. It's not perfect but it's more perfect than just using one piece. So we put it together and called the biointegration code. When we put these together, it's a process of evaluating clients, patients, whatever, to sort of say, I think I can get a better perspective of what's bothering you and therefore have a better idea of what I can do to help you, right? Okay, so drugs that further block choline uptake, common anticholinergic drugs like Benadryl, linked to increased dementia risk. This just came out less than a month ago from Harvard. And basically it says, yeah, you know, you block the, you block the choline, you're, you're going to decrease the acetylcholine and therefore they're not going to be very good learners or remember who you are. And so that came from the JAMA article, which basically said pretty much the same thing. Um, several years ago, highlighted the link between long-term use of anticholinergic medications like Benadryl and other anticholinergic drugs that block the activation of acetylcholine. It's a substance that transmits messages in the nervous system. In the brain, acetylcholine is involved in learning and memory. In the rest of the body, it stimulates muscle contractions. That's what acetylcholine is. So if you've ever heard of the disease called myosinia gravis, um, it's the lack of, it's really a receptor problem, but basically it's the inability of acetylcholine to stimulate muscle contraction. What happens is people get older, they tend to get more incontinent in terms of worrying about leaky urine and so on, as we all have heard of the various advertisements. Um, but the problem is they take in uh, anticholinergic drugs to stop with spastic bladder and therefore they push themselves along that continuum towards cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, the cognitive impairment to dementia, to possibly even Alzheimer's, certainly to poor memory and learning. Okay, anticholinergic drugs are a modifiable risk factor. You have to be aware of it. They include antihistamines, antidepressants, antidepressants, uh, medications with gastrointestinal and bladder disorders. These medications have short-term adverse effects, immediate short-term, unless you're taking it long-term. The story always is multifactorial in the end. Hence, we put the panels together. But that's the only way we can differentiate how are you different than the person next to you. We can't all do the same thing and get the same outcome. It just doesn't work that way. Every doctor will agree. So you do a gross analysis and you come up with some recommendations. But not everything works for everybody. That's why we do it this way.
Hi, I just wanted to add, if this is something you're interested in, going deeper on all these little things and realizing how they really do add together to figure out why things aren't working for people, then I'm sure that you would appreciate watching this other video. Take care.